Union Square behind us. Uh, joining me in the hot set is Gregory Hessian. Gregory Hessian is a lawyer, has been for 20 years in the state of Massachusetts, primarily dealing with Department of Child and Family Services, uh, restraining orders, and uh, you know family court. Uh, so thank you so much for being on the show. Good evening. Good, Good evening. To be here. Thank you. I came to learn of, of Gregory through a friend of mine who turned me on to this website, uh, massoutrage.com. I, I scoured the website and was immediately just impressed with the the boldness of it you know I mean you really hold nothing back uh, so I guess let's just get right into it you've worked in dozens and dozens of cases with child and family services mm -hmm. uh, what's your impression of the agency well the Department of Children and Families is a monstrous agency mm -hmm. it's huge billion dollar agency and it, it leverages even more billions every year just in this one state and there's uh, the same kind of an agency in every state in this uh, country. And when you work with the agency long enough and you watch how they do it, you really find out that it's a completely dysfunctional uh, group of people. Even though they're dealing with human lives and very, very difficult things in terms of parent-child issues and potential abuse and neglect. And this is an agency that literally can't even keep track of their pieces of paper, mm -hmm. never mind deal with the human issues that uh, they're called upon to do and uh, from what I've seen um, they really can't they, they really can't get it done their approach that they use is very mechanistic they treat people typically like machines like they have no feelings like uh, they're just uh, a case and who wrote these laws who wrote this how did how was Child, children and family services even established well th actually started back in uh, 1974 on the federal level and what they did is they passed these very drastic federal laws that imposed um, this system on every state if they wanted to get a lot of federal cash and every state immediately uh, bowed and, and kneeled and uh, took the money and established the system and the 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 way that the um, system is set up it sort of starting point is something called a an abuse hotline mm -hmm. And people can call that hotline if they want to report child abuse or neglect. And there's the first uh, point of where the system goes wrong. Cranky neighbors. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Angry ex-spouses. Mm -hmm. um, Busybodies. Uh, people who don't really know what abuse or neglect is and are misreporting it. There's probably like an 80% wrong reporting rate. Uh, I call it the snitch network because this is the same kind of a network that uh, people like Fidel Castro set up in, in Cuba to report your neighbors if they were uh, anti-state wow. or what we'd see in Russia you know, back in the, in the time of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and then unfortunately, the same thing sort of happened. In Cuba, if you were reported, a van would pull up and, and they would disappear. Uh. And this is what happens in the Department of Children and Families. A van pulls up and your children disappear. They come in at gunpoint. They rip the children out of the, out of the arms, screaming and crying. And um, typically, these cases, if the children even do come back, uh, can take a year or two before that happens. And all this while, of course, the parents are just heartbroken, and they wake up every morning. Yeah, the psychological impact on the children, on the family, and yeah, and this is all without due process, without a jury. I mean, this is just someone can call in, and and right. and just and that happens. It's they absolutely can call in. absurd. And, and DCF can make its own decision based on one of these snitch reports to just simply go out without a court order, without a warrant. This is the only thing except for the Internal Revenue Service. Figure, they can steal your money, they can steal your kids without yeah. warrants. <laughs> the two most important things you have probably. Yes, yeah. But they can walk into the house with guns, without a warrant, and go in that house and take these kids. And then the next day, go over to the court and say, hey, judge, uh, we took the kids. Everything all right? Sure, no problem. Wow. And in almost every case, the judge is going to validate the action that they took because the judges are very typically drawn from Department of Children and Families employee ranks. They used to be lawyers for DCF. Now they're a judge 
involved with one of the parties involved in every case, which really means that uh, in most cases, DCF's way is the way. It's the way. And what got you in? What, what was your, what compelled you to get into family law? Well, it, I sort of backed into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing a variety of cases like many people do at the beginning of their legal career. Maybe they aren't quite settled as to what they're going to do. And then I ran into a DCF case. And the, the absurdities of it uh, just were so, were, were, were so, um, uh, it was, it's hard to describe. If you're used to a certain type of law, we're used to due process, we're used to rules of evidence, we're, we're used to innocent until proven guilty, we're, we're used to uh, uh, burdens of proof that you have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt before you can uh, deprive somebody of rights. All these things are completely thrown out the door in these cases. So the case that would appear before that was a regular case, uh, you know, somebody even just not having their driver's license or something has ten times as many rights as the parent who then appears in the next case and has their children taken away without any of those rights. Wow. And so that's what intrigued me. And I said, what is going on here? This can't possibly be. Law school doesn't teach you this. They never tell you about this. So it was, it, it was just uh, eye-popping. And I said, I've got to do this. I've got some, something's really wrong here. And the more I studied it, the wronger it got. I'd only seen the surface when I did this first case. And the further you go and the more you study, uh, the, the more horrifying it really gets. Yeah, and so now currently, to date, in the state of Massachusetts, how many children are in the custody of the Children and Family Services? In almost every, uh, almost at any one time, there's about 10 to 11,000 children in the custody, I would say captivity. Yeah. Uh, and they, they vary, you know, because some go in, some go out every day. But there's a consistent number at any one time of 10 to 11,000. And countrywide, it's about 500,000 children at any one time are in custody. Outrageous. Mass outrage, right. Mass and outrage. Well, yeah. that's why I decided to call my website Mass Outrage, yeah. because, frankly, I got outraged about the whole thing. It is really wrong. Yeah, of doing. course. What are some of the strangest cases you've come across, like where they have no proof of this abuse at home, yet they go in and they take these children away from the mother or the father? Oh, there's quite a variety of things. Oh, yeah, uh, I homeschool families. They don't like homeschool families because they're independent and the, the state doesn't have their eyes on the children. So that really bothers them. Um, families who believe in corporal punishment in spanking children, that really bothers them. They will take children like that in a heartbeat. Even though our Supreme Judicial Court has explicitly said that spanking children is not child abuse, mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't leave injuries or wounds. Um, sometimes, for example, um, a, a child will uh, sass a parent, and the parent may s just slap the child across the face or something of that sort. They'll take a child away. In fact, then they go, uh, for example, say the father did that. The teenager perhaps sassed the, the, the father. The mother's over across the room, 10 feet away, and observes this. They then say the father is guilty of abuse, the mother is guilty of neglect, because she somehow couldn't fly across the room like Superman and interpose herself between the, the, the father and the daughter in that, in that uh, nanosecond that it took to have that event. So, uh, it, but there are many, many things like that that uh, just don't constitute abuse or neglect. Um, some parents smoke marijuana, even without, not even near the children, but that will trigger it. Um, th there's all kinds of yeah, this, stuff. This yeah, is, this is awful. And so, at this point now, so you know, I can imagine too social workers that get into what they're d get into social working to mm -hmm. really want to they want to make a difference, you know, and how quickly they're just disenchanted, and and completely overloaded with work, yes. and they're by the book. A lot of them have never experienced any of this. They're mm -hmm. fresh out of college, you know, and they're just abiding by rules. How much money goes into this? How much money does go into DCF from the federal? Do you know how much they get a year? Well, you can't just look at their budget. Okay. Um, the budget's probably $800 million. Wow. A bunch of that is reimbursed from the feds in a very, very complex um, reimbursement scheme because it's all in different compartments. So there's not a check. Yeah. There's, and, and then what they've learned to do is they've learned to leverage all kinds of other programs such as educational programs, um, Medicaid, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they, they, they drug these children, most of the children that they take, most of them they send to therapy. Yes. Uh, then they also put most of them on an individual educational program so that they can now be special needs students, which leverages a lot more federal educational money. And so they, it's sort of a, a, a hub and spoke situation. They go out and try to get as many other federal uh, reimbursements from all different other departments as possible while the children are in their care. Wow. And uh, they even hired Arthur Anderson, which was a major consulting firm before it, it actually went out of business. They, sp they paid them $5 million to teach them how to get as much federal reimbursement as possible and how to plug the children into all these various programs mm -hmm. so that they could maximize the reimbursements. So instead of putting the children into programs based on the need of the child, they put the children in the programs based on the cash. It's all about the Oh, money. my goodness. This perpetuated and systematic form of abuse and oppression. And, yeah, I mean, you can see it. It's just, it's really, it's, it's weakening the family nucleus. It's instead of mm -hmm. uniting, it's completely mm -hmm. dividing. And that's wrong. And that should be called out. And, you know, and, and I wonder, like, what, what do the, what stand do, do the legislators and the senators take on this? Well, um, has anyone brought it up in the state house well, level? Many, many people bring it up. Okay, but the the problem is, from if you're a state legislator, what matters to you is getting reelected mm -hmm. and getting plenty of money, plenty of power, plenty of influence, mm -hmm. and the people that matter, i.e., the the ones who set political agendas, the people with power and the insiders and the media and so forth, are all about making sure that you don't. Um, violate this um, this sort of unwritten rule about you can't change the child abuse laws because if you were to as a state legislator try to deal with the problems in the system that were anti-child and anti-parent mm -hmm. it would look like you were enabling child abuse mm -hmm. and so that would immediately attract the attention of the people that matter and you would be vilified and probably uh, kicked out of office next election because they would say, "Oh, you're you you know you 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 like child abuse. You're a child you know you're a, a child uh, a child abuse enabler." Mm, sure, sure, sure. Of course. Can't have that happen. So nothing's going to get fixed unless there's a societal pressure. Mm -hmm. Once the pressure goes the other way, then the people that matter will adopt that that sort of thinking and uh, and then it'll eventually come down to the state legislature but they never sui sponte they never change anything on their own unless there's enough pressure to do it right. go back to the point you made when you talk about family disintegration mm -hmm. one of their other uh, clever tricks that they very often use is a social worker will go into a family such as the one I described for example where the father slapped the child mm -hmm. and they'll say to the mother you must get a restraining order a domestic abuse restraining under under order under chapter 209A and kick dad out and um, the child has to be on the order too and if this um, father ever comes back in the house we're going to take the child out of the house. So they go down to the district court, they get a restraining order, kick dad out, now the family is under tremendous financial and emotional strain and this will continue on for quite a while until they finally relent. and. They'll make the father go to maybe a batterer's program or, you know, anger management or something of this sort. Once that's complete, which takes typically a year, wow. then they maybe will allow. But if, if they catch the parents together, they will immediately swoop in and take the child out of the family. Wow. So this is, it's a divide and conquer strategy that they, that they yeah. commonly use. Yeah, and I believe too, I mean, one mustn't make a judgment without the proper data. <coughs> And they're not, they're making judgments without data and without evidence. Um, and so it's, it's uh, you know, for those that know me, they know, you know that I uh, was a victim of trauma. I too was a victim of child's, uh, of the Department of Child and Family Services 17 years ago. And, um, and it greatly, it had such an incredible impact um, on myself and my two sisters and my mother. Uh, completely disintegrated and, and uh, caused so much anxiety, anxiety that still bubbles up on occasion. Um, and my sister died last year and, uh, of a heroin overdose. And I believe that there's a direct correlation between 
my sister's death and um, and the uh, um, involvement of Department of Ch Children and Family Services Agency. Um, not only did they do um, to us what they did to us, but they did the same thing to Whitney and her young son. And they, she was living a nightmare. That was the, her last words to me. I said, I had texted her, I had a dream about her. And she said, was it a nightmare? And so, yeah, this is something that, I, that I'm very, very, very interested in, in, in dissecting. I want to know mm -hmm. everything there is to know about the Department of Child and Family Services. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'm so happy that you're on the show and that you're talking about this. Now, well, I can give you a core issue yeah. that will help you understand at the core level where they go off. Okay. I mean, there's a bunch of things we've talked about. Yeah. But when a report of abuse or neglect comes into the agency, there is, there is where everything starts going wrong. They start investigating. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the problem, is they don't know how mm -hmm. to investigate. These are people that have graduated social work school. They're going to come out and save the world. And, you know, they go into, they, they very frequently don't have children themselves. They don't really understand how kids work and how they can be. They make absurd statements such as, well, we always believe the child. <laughs> now, say you have a 16-year-old girl which who would really, really like to go and be with her boyfriend, and dad says, no, the guy's a jerk. <laughs> you know, he's not coming in. So all the child has to do, because she's been told this again and again and again at school, is say, daddy hit me, or daddy hurt me, or daddy touched me, or something of that sort. End. Wow. Child's out of the home forever. Wow. She will never come home. That family will never see that child again, because now she's 16. It, you know, by the time she ages out, at 18 she'll still be in the system and she'll never be back and she will be put with a foster family and the foster family will let her see the boyfriend and everything's great their investigation capacity is where if you wanted to go because you were saying you wanted to know where the real touchstones are and that's it when a report comes in they are required to do one of two types of investigations an emergency investigation which must be completed within just a few days or a non-emergency one, which has to be completed in 15 days. Mm. And they couldn't investigate their way out of a paper bag because their investigation oftentimes just consists of making a couple phone calls, maybe call the pediatrician, maybe call the school counselor, n sometimes not talk to the family even long enough to have a clue what's happening, and very often don't even talk to the person who's being accused of doing something. Oh my very frequently, in fact, probably more often than not, mm -hmm. not talking to the person who's actually accused. And they write it up in a report, and then they make conclusions, which are then going to affect this family, not just for this year, but probably forever. And if those conclusions are that there really was abuse, they may come and take the children. They will go to get a court order from the, um, from the, the court and take the children, or if it's drastic enough, they think it's drastic enough, they'll just go and take them without the court order and get the court order later. So this investigation process is where everything starts going way off the rails. They don't do it well. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> once it gets into court, now there's a parallel process. Neither of uh, the right or left hand know what the other is doing. So this administrative case that's started by this investigation just keeps clunking along like a wheezing old machine and then a court case is going along as well at the same time. So the parents fighting two different things that are hardly uh, connecting properly. And um, if what happens from that investigation results in restraining order, now you're in a different court dealing with that. If what happens also results in a divorce, which isn't uncommon, mm -hmm. now you're in a third court. And if what happens results in a criminal allegation, which is not also uncommon. For example, they say, oh, well, that, that, that slap was an assault and a battery. We're going to report this to the district attorney, and they have a district attorney reporting requirement for anything that can be construed to be a criminal matter. Now you're in a fourth court, and uh, this is what I call the Iron Triangle of Family Law. Yes, yes, I remember reading that. And what ends up happening Think about how, how could you maintain employment, for example, mm -hmm. and be trying to respond to four different legal processes, all with different timings and different hearings at different things. Your boss would fire you. You're never going to show up for work. You're always at some hearing somewhere. And, and then the services they send you to mm -hmm. are always during working hours. So the people that don't work, well, they can do them. 
but people who do work, and maybe particularly if, if um, the working person has been kicked out of the house by a restraining order, now what happens if that income ceases because he's in four different courts? Yeah, what a struggle. And now there's no more money. Right. Now the other part of the family living in the house either can't pay the rent or can't pay the mortgage. Then what happens? So the DCF comes in very um, snidely and says, well, just go on welfare. And um, we'll just lose your house and we'll provide a housing voucher and you can have welfare and food stamps and everything else and everything will be just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now you can become dependent on the state and everything's great. And I can't even, and, and what's also just so, it's all so disheartening and, and, and I, I feel I have so much compassion and empathy for all of these families that are constantly having to deal with this. And, and I wonder, is there, do they offer support groups? Like, are there, I imagine there must be a place where people can go to, to meet and talk about this. Or we mentioned earlier, over the years, there have been little bursts uh, here and there of groups, but they fizzle out. And why is that? Well, um, I think for several reasons. Mm -hmm. Even though many of the people who have started some of these groups have had very good intentions and have had actually pretty good skills for organizing, people don't want to be part of that group for long because there's a stigma. Who wants to be part of a child abuse group mm -hmm. where you're an abuser? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when your case finally is over, very large number of people want to just simply put it in the rearview mirror and never see or think about this ever again. It's the worst chapter of their lives and they don't want to talk about it. Now, a certain number of people will stay with the issue yes, and try to help, but many people just want to put it behind. And lastly, one of the big problems in getting a group like this is a lot of sort of fringe characters get involved. Mm -hmm. Some of the people who really are kind of abusive and maybe have some mental illnesses or other problems that bring that into the center of the group. Mm -hmm and they tend to um, be a, a negative influence sure, as opposed sure. to a helpful one. Mm -hmm. So, As a victim, myself as a victim, um, you know, my mother was never abusive. She was a loving woman, always showed us so much love and attention and care. She was depressed and families have difficulties. Most families have difficulties. Yes. I'm on the end where they, I was abused by Department of Children and Family Services, and I imagine there are others like me. So mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's, I should put out a call, you know, and, and ask and, and maybe do a little, uh, you know, announcement on a television show or now, hey, if you're out there and you've experienced <coughs> something similar, please feel free to get in touch. Email Fallon's Daily Toast at gmail.com. Um, I want to know too, I mean, I, and imagine these families that are moving here from the Dominican Republic and from Puerto Rico that don't speak English. Uh, you know, I, I recently ran into an interpreter who worked for DCF. And he said, I, I was there for a few months and I quit. It was terrible. You know, they were, the, the children were being, you know, flown over from, you know, wherever, elsewhere to live with maybe their grandparents. And they were kind of acting up at school, but the mm -hmm. grandparents couldn't, you know, deal. But it shouldn't have been that it, what happened was that DCF swooped in, took the child out. Now this family, you know, that can't speak very good English is confused. What is happening here? What? And, you know, and, and they look at the interpreter as the, the uh, enemy also when he's just trying or he or she is just trying to help uh, make things right and you know it's just it's so it's terrifying it's legitimately terrifying what hap is happening mm -hmm. uh, and it definitely needs to be addressed and so what and I guess that's my we have just about maybe four or five minutes left and I uh, ten minutes maybe and I want to talk to you what is the solution what can we do to fix this well it started with laws okay and it started with families that are hurting Mm -hmm. I think there's two things. Certainly not all the law's fault, mm -hmm. and it's not all the family's fault, but there's, there's some blame to go around. The legislators are terrified of changing the law lest they look like enablers, as we talked about earlier. But once society, I think, begins to change its own sentiments about this, that this isn't the way to deal with family issues, mm -hmm. then I, it, eventually the law can possibly change. But there's also been a, a change in family thinking as well over these last couple of decades, which has made um, child protection that much more difficult because in, in um, families that are headed by one parent um, and <coughs> poverty, a lot of drug use, 
all these factors put tremendous pressure on the society. And frankly, I feel like society is fractured yes, in a lot more way than many years ago. Mm -hmm. And an agency which can barely deal with things when they're in good situations is certainly not well equipped to deal with these additional fractures and problems of single family households and all this other thing that, that comes to their attention. It's hard enough for a family of a husband and a wife and children to cope with DCF when they get in their lives. But at least there's two parents who are working together to try to solve the problem, and they barely make it many times. Mm -hmm. When there's one parent only, DCF can bully uh, with impunity, and oftentimes that parent has almost you know, no backup and yeah. help. So I don't see a ready solution to this. Mm -hmm. I think that because of family problems, uh, th these people I who find themselves at the business end of DCF, like that single mother, mm -hmm. how is she going to really affect any change? Mm -hmm. She can be frustrated by what happens, but she has no political influence, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. She's just going to be uh, rolled by the by the power of the yeah, agency. Overlooked, snubbed. Yes, and, and, and the people that do have the power and influence are uh, not in any way interested that I can see. When it looks bad enough, Governor Baker will step in and say, oh, we're going we're gonna to make a new, um, uh, what he did, here, here, is, here is how we solved the problem of a whole bunch of children being dying in their custody in, in the Worcester region. We're going to make a new regional director. Oh, that'll solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Then the one point when a whole bunch of children were killed, they changed the name from Department of Social Services, Department of Children's Yes, Family. I remember it was DSS That's when I was... It. Up you know, and then they did this, and they did. In other words, it's just cosmetic uh, kinds of changes. So. Now, before we we uh, before this ends, I wanted to. Where can people get in touch with you? Do they they can go to mass massoutrage dot com? Um, yes. And uh, yeah, and I just want to thank you so very much for being on the show, and thank you, folks, for tuning in at home. And uh, yeah, you can watch us go live every Friday night, and this won't be the last time you see Gregory. We're gonna have him on again. Maybe we'll come over.